I don't see any questions on my side, but I have a question for Dr. Chapa. Um, can you comment on any data regarding maternal and fetal morbidity and mortality based on where patients receive their care, community versus tertiary care center? Um, so, so yeah, there, there is some data out there that, um, that there is a higher rate of morbidity, um, uh, both maternal and, 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 uh, neonatal, uh, at very low volume, um, places. Uh, that being said, I think, um, the, the key is to, you know, identify patients at risk, um, ahead of time and then try to get them to deliver it in the right location. So um, I think that's where these screening tools that, that I kind of talked about come into play. Um, and we really have to match um, the risk factors that the patient has with the resources um, that are provided to them both prenatally and uh, during at the time of delivery. Thank you. <clears throat> what would you consider a low volume hospital for the uh, maternal care? How many deliveries per year? Well, I think uh, in 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 the literature and the studies that are out there, um, under a thousand deliveries is considered a low volume. A thousand deliveries is kind of a, a a reasonable number to get to. Thanks. We have a question that came through in the chat from Scarlett. Are fetuses of mothers with Sjogren's disease Show, I forgot how you say it. Sjogren's disease at risk of AV block. Yeah, that's one of the um, maternal antibodies that can also be implicit in heart block. All right, and uh, one more, two more actually. Uh, let's see, complex heart malformations requires complex solutions. Two situations that put the patient in jeopardy. How has been the cognitive development of those patients? Um, so, important question, and uh, and that's uh, we've actually come a long way in terms of managing these babies and, and children with complex hearts. Uh, subjecting a baby to a cardiopulmonary bypass early in their life does have a what's a measurable and clear effect on the developing brain. Having said that, uh, the findings that has been seen, at least in long-term uh, follow-up with detailed neurological assessment, that is, if the patient did not have a serious neurological event during these procedures, the likelihood is that they're going to be very close to uh, normal, uh, not compromised at least. So unless the patient has had a prolonged tracheotic arrest uh, for arch reconstruction or has had a cardiac arrest for which the, there was some uh, uh, the, uh, interruption of blood supply to the brain. So in general, yes, there is a possibility that they do have a, a neurological event. Uh, having said that, we have improved dramatically over the many years that the congenital heart surgery has evolved, and most of these kids, at least with non-complex ones, they do fine. They're normal. With a very complex one, they may have some uh, delayed, subtle, uh, uh, neurological uh, um, um, uh, delayed milestones. Having said that, um, this comes part of the complex management of these patients rather than, and the only other option uh, is to subject each one of them to a heart transplant, which is not actually a feasible solution. I don't know if Alistair wants to add something to that. Yeah, I think uh, it's a very important area. We are fortunate we have an incredible neurology team here, neurodevelopmental team. Uh, and as Dr. Najem said, you know, 
the putting these patients on bypass within the first six months of life put you at increased risk of having attention deficit disorders, but early intervention, but also excellent surgery and excellent outcomes reduce that risk over time. Um, and then having to do repeat surgeries and interventions clearly have an impact. Um, but developing a planned approach is critical. And I, I think where we're looking to take some of this is doing fetal interventions where clearly there's going to be potential for improved long-term neurological outcomes. All right, we have one last question that came through the chat. Health disparities go hand, hand in hand with social discrimination by race and ethnicity. Do you take these elements as risk factors when assessing your population of OB patients? Sure, sure, we, we do. And um, we, we've taken a, a number of steps um, towards trying to address those disparities here locally in Cleveland. Um, uh, while we've consolidated um, obstetrical care um, to larger centers and larger hospitals where we no longer have host small hospitals um, that deliver babies. Uh, one of the things we've done is we've moved our outpatient uh, uh, and we've expanded outpatient services and we've set up um, a number of uh, outpatient clinics in areas uh, primarily uh, where we're serving some of these, uh, you know, minority populations that have uh, access, less access to care. So we are act actively taking steps to, to address that. We're also doing a lot of outreach uh, outside of um, just, you know, here in Cleveland to surrounding areas um, where we can also help in, in this regard. And I, I think just in general, I think the our approach is improving access of care um, coordination of care for all, and really, again, as the tagline says, is every life deserves world-class care. I think Cleveland Clinic is really taking a leadership role in improving and trying to eliminate the social economic disparities of healthcare, which is crit a critical issue across the board, um, and I think we all need to do a much better job, and I think that's why we're interested in uh, improving access to care for all. If I may uh, add, uh, I've been at the clinic now, this is my fifth year, and uh, I have to say that I've not in any single, not even a single occasion that I've been alarmed by even the uh, equality of care, as in somebody has or does not have an insurance. Once the patient or the baby or the child comes into the hospital, then that's it. The baby gets or the child gets the care that the baby needs. And, and I think uh, I'm, I'm actually uh, very proud of what the cleaner, cleaner clinic policies in that. I do have a question actually, if time allows to Dr. Murray, with the permission of the uh, <laughs> moderator. Um, Karen, uh, so although you may not see a lot of those because they tend to present later on in life, but what is the behavior of those congestive hepatopathy compared to those with a drug-induced hepatic failure or cirrhosis? Those are related to heart. They obviously tend to, dis to present later on, but uh, if you are, any advices for us is, as to when are we gonna actually should probably call you in or you should call us in when before, because once they get into an advanced stage, their transplant is no good, and we're going to have to do a liver and heart. So. Yeah, so, so your question is a really good one, and, and, and I'm glad you're asking it. So um, as relates to drug-induced liver disease, most drug-induced liver disease is, is relatively acute or short-lived, and you stop the drug and it resolves. Um, even for those with longer term, the impact um, uh, in a chronic liver disease sense is, is much more insidious. So for uh, congestive heart ailments that um, may uh, leave the liver persistently under high pressures, there is there are a couple of patterns of hepatic injury uh, that we see. And the, sort of the, the, the purest 
liver hepatopathy is actually a um, insidious onset of, of inflammation first, and then um, scarring develops, and, and folks develop cirrhosis. And and um, we see this in a number of your um, you know various palliative um, surgeries, but with ongoing uh, pressure derangement. Uh, to your point, we as hepatologists would much rather see them earlier. Um, these are uh, rarely are there hepatic therapies that we can offer, but we can help prognosticate when the timing might be right for a heart transplant or something before there is such advanced liver disease that it would also require a liver transplant. Exactly much, um, yeah. much, fi mo much hepatic fibrosis until the the very later stages um, is actually reversible. So just because there's hepatic fibrosis does not mean that if if the problem were alleviated, the liver wouldn't heal. Um, it may very well. Once you have uh, very mature cirrhosis and maybe hypersplenism and complications from cirrhosis, um, then the, the portal hypertension is too advanced. Actually, this, if this I would like Alistair to comment on this because this is really an important, uh, important area that we face every day. And if you are able to tell us uh, as a hepatologist that this is now, you're getting into a serious problem, the time they get listed for a heart without being on an assist device until they get a heart, it's probably around, what, a year or more? Probably more sometimes if they are at home. Correct. During this time, by the time yes. you list the patient and you have them, the liver is gone or actually got worse or at least whatever. So is there an argument for actually putting forward to the classification is those single ventricle patients, once they start having an initiation of liver dysfunction, surely enough is that you actually start listing them so you can accrue time on the waiting list. Yeah, so before Alistair answers, let me um, uh, sort of make one comment. So liver dysfunction is less common, but what one does get is the development of portal hypertension from scarring, uh, most commonly. And um, so if we had the ability to assess, if you knew a trajectory that the patient was on, that they were eventually going to need a heart transplant, and the question is when. We could then assess through histology and other maneuvers what the health of the liver is and how much time, basically, based on the child's age or the time that the heart disease has been going on, what the expected prognosis is. And, and it, it wouldn't be 100%, but if you could crystal ball, if, you, if you know, we could, for instance, say, you know, in one more year's time, the pathology has been going on for 10 years, um, the amount of interval damage additional will not be so much or will be, you know, too much um, to help prognosticate what to do. And I, I think it's something that we're very interested in, you know, with the center of Fontan optimization that we've done through HVI is working with the hepatologist to answer that question. So the problem with the allocation of organs, it's how does the heart look at the time and not looking at other organs, where it's probably the driver is going to be the liver disease. What hasn't been done and what we're really now looking to do is working with the pediatric as well as the adult teams so that we can look at this longitudinally and seeing where the time to intervene is. And there hasn't been any good longitudinal data starting at patients from like 10 years of age that have had a Fontan and looking at them serially. So we're going to be starting looking at MRIs, and then doing biopsies probably every two years, and then hopefully being able to answer that question. Well, potentially adding liver biopsies and doing transhepatic pressure measurements, I think, would be would be very helpful to see what the development is. 